I went on a trip to US, having supposed to have breakfast in the World Trade Center on 9 11. Wow. And I missed the bus, then everything changed. If you take this road, it has a lot of actually road blockers. They normally start by shooting. I called my boss, uh, in your briefing, you didn't mention bulletproof vests or something, right? <laughs> this was the biggest complaint of my boss in Iraq. He never find me in my office. Where are you? I'm in Mosul, sir. Like, Mosul? How did you even go there? So I said, don't worry, we'll fix it later. And then, <laughs> and so on. So if I want to tell my team to climb the tower, then mm. I should be there. If I'm asking you to sacrifice your life, what is it? Is your life more valuable than my life? Really? So it's not. Unwrapped Tech Leadership Journeys, Baldur Connect Podcast. All right, Amir, so good to see you again, and thank you so much for taking the time to coming on the show. Thank you very much. Same here. All right, so just to give a bit of a background so our audience has a, an idea of who they're listening to, so Amir Abdelazim, I'm not sure if I said this correct. In the English version, right. <laughs> All right. All right. So, Amir, you have a very interesting life story. You work all around the world. You grew up in Egypt. You have a massive career in history with telecom giants that everybody would recognize. Um, in your own words, if I'm not mistaken, you call yourself a wartime CEO. So I definitely want to want to get into this as well. You lived and worked in a lot of war-torn countries, building internet infrastructure. You come from a technical background. So when people say global tech leadership, I think you're the kind of person that actually embodies that term. It's not just thrown around uh, lightly in your case. You have extensive experience leading tech operations in crisis and challenging environments. And it's not in locations like the Maldives or Thailand or Malaysia, but it's places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Uganda, and Chad. Uh, you directly contributed and, uh, and helped bring, I believe, more than 1.4 billion people online. And that's billion with a B. Um, for Iraq specifically, you guys went from 167th in the world to 57th in the world in terms of uh, the infrastructure that you developed there. I know you connected uh, lots of people to the internet. If I look at your resume, it's a lot of starting positions as engineer, engineer, then team lead, then uh, you know CTO, co-founder, founder, director, and now again, you're getting into founding your own companies. And uh, I definitely want to get into that as well. You're an alumni of Harvard Business School and London Business School as well. Is there anything else there that we haven't covered so far in your resume or anything that I got wrong that, uh, that we can add in there? Actually, this is, was one of my challenges in the beginning of moving into career. Actually, it's um, when you are coming from pure tech background, not pure IT background, it's normally hard for you to break a barrier in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, it's easier for the uh, people from IT like Microsoft. And yeah, and I didn't work in Afghanistan. I wish to. So I think they need help. But you did have projects uh, in Afghanistan, Yes, I did right? remote projects. Okay. Okay, I understand. Chapter one, who is Amir Abdelazim? How did your kind of uh, your upbringing, your background, how did that lead you to working in all these different places? Could you maybe give a bit of a summary in your words, how you went from being kind of a technical person to you know, dealing with all of these crisis places and such critical infrastructure. I normally split my life into two. It's around 9-11, surprisingly, actually. Okay. So I started, I'm grown up in Egypt, Alexandria. My uh, father is one of real, like, hardcore engineers. My mom from also R&D in the chemical industry. And mm -hmm. they both grew up in a tough time in Egypt, actually, where it was wars and uh, and situations one of the things that my dad was always focusing on that he's really like invested in us getting uh, education is the right way actually i think for his mindset the education was the only way to, um. to go. so grown up in alexandria i graduated from faculty of engineering in communication and uh, electronics and then i went on a trip to us okay before that i would call myself in my own term is now such a brat, honestly. Like, yeah, sure. My dad is working hard. My mom is working hard. And I enjoy my life in nice schools, play football professionally, mm. and then go into a trip in the US, summer courses, plus summer exploring the world. It was my first trip. Mm -hmm. And having, um, supposed to have actually a breakfast in the World Trade Center on 9 11. Wow. And I missed the bus, and then everything changed. This is not the first time I'm hearing this. There's a couple other prominent people that were supposed to have appointments uh, in the World Trade Center on 9-11 and they missed the flight or something like this. So uh, do you attribute that to pure 
luck or is that faith or how, how do you, have you reflected on that at all? You know, at some point of time that your, um, your guts knowing better than you, our DNA and our, our subconscious is million years older than us. And if you're able, I would say loudly now, actually, like after years, I'm sure I wouldn't have elaborated it 20 years ago, but yeah. I think now I believe that if you're able to connect well with your guts, like you get really like connection to your inner soul, you listen to it. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't need to, to delay two minutes this morning, actually, not to get the bus. I see. Something completely like really not even significant to remember it, that I had to go back and come back and then I missed the bus. Yeah, and, right. And call all my friends and tell them don't go. So wow. uh, the point what I was trying to, to say is I believe definitely on the butterfly effect that things happen and go right. in sequence. You need to double down when you feel it's right and you need to stop when you actually really feel it's not really things. It changed one thing about my perception of risk actually. And uh, having talked about the war uh, a little bit earlier, that's, uh, I love to say that I know I'm a risk taker, but actually I don't think I'm a risk taker. I um, think I learned it that day how to manage your life under risk. And it's totally uh -huh. different. Think about complications of uh, my race. Egyptian passport as well. Egyptian passport. Of the leader of the 9-11 terrorist group was from Alexandria, from my city. Wow. And he was announced at like 8 p.m. in the day, if I'm not mistaken. And this was all like, I'm a kid. And like, when I go out in the street and I'll stand, uh, 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 who am I now? Am I, was I supposed to really die here? Or, or am I supposed to be uh, arrested now? And people are anger and fear. It's a lot of mm. emotions. So long story short, yeah, you get into tests for a reason. And if you don't capture what comes out of it and reflect around it, it goes in vain, then you, um, that's when some people like get dragged into suffering, into their own trauma, or actually yeah. others try to stop and reflect and say, okay, that was not. That was a close call. What can I learn from that? It taught me something for sure. And I insisted to go the next year back. Can I ask you, why did you call your friends and tell them not to go? Um, because actually, I don't know. I thought I don't want to be late for them. And I said, guys, yeah. you know what? I'm going to be late. Don't go now. I will let you know when I'm taking the next bus. No, no, no. And uh, they were angry, of course, but uh, that I missed the appointment as usual. I'm sure they owe you a big debt of gratitude for the rest of their now life. Now I have a lifetime blanche to be late. So, no. so it's a good thing of that. I mean, when, we, when I was getting ready for this, I didn't think we we're going to go into this direction, but I, I'm actually really curious because, um, you know, like I, I read a lot, uh, you, you go through for self-improvement, then you go through biographies, then you go through practical business application, whether it's marketing books or whatever that is. And eventually you kind of go to philosophy, you, you get bored of the stuff. So I'm at the stage where I'm getting into some esoteric topics, right? And I'm not okay. saying some Reddit blog post. I'm talking about like published, you know, successful professors. Like one of them is uh, Diana walsh Basalka, who's a religious study, I believe at UCLA or one of those... Uh, University. So she's got a couple of books that I've recently been listening to. And um, if, tell me if you find this boring, but I, I want to kind of explore it. Um, she explores the topic of um, these weird religious phenomenon and what we call um, almost mysterious phenomena in Christianity specifically. Yeah? So she got access to the Vatican Library. She went through the library. She was reading about different saints, people who supposedly levitated or had some kind of these powers that we hear about in the Bible, the Quran, and Bhagavad Gita, and all of these books, right? And it's quite interesting. And, you know, the whole UFO topics kind of ties into it as well. But the, my main takeaway was that related to what you said is it seems like the human intelligence has developed over such a long time. And it appears to be something in, I don't know if it's in the quantum space or whatever that is, but we seem to have some kind of intuition that's outside of our perception in the given moment. And she talks about other people who just say they get these information downloads and it's scientists who have hundreds of patents in industries that are unrelated to their field. And they just say they get into this meditative state where they're really in tune with their body. They don't drink, they don't smoke, they don't interact with people a lot. And they're able to access this kind of almost like a global network of information of humanity. You know, it, it seems bizarre, but when you brought it up, that's the first thought that came to my mind. 
so bizarre, actually, at least for me. So I wish you, you can read Arabic. There is an Arabic book called No with the Flavor of Flamenco. Okay. I will check the English translation. I will uh, uh, try to find it. But there is also a Nobel Prize book, Think Fast, Think Slow. Mm -hmm. I've read um, that one, yeah. It's actually taking you through the same direction from the scientific point of view, from the psychology action. So at least the scientific explanation, which I kind of relate to, yes, our DNA carries our knowledge. And that's why we yeah. keep it with us. That's for sure. We are not tapping yeah. into the full uh, potential of our capabilities. That's no. also for sure. What's scientifically proven that we have seven layers of consciousness. And the deepest one is the one what you just mentioned that you are connecting to the universe. No, no, no. And this engaging from uh, your physical body. And those are all science. I'm not talking about uh, Google, no nonsense, up, yeah. Uh, books. So, and I think if I'm not mistaken, I'm, I wouldn't call myself expert there, but it really ring a bell in me that we keep four generations of knowledge of our land in our subconscious and uh, it accumulates. So your four generations, what they have done, it's connected with you. That's why you feel good mm -hmm. in a place where you don't, you never been there before you said, and maybe if you do your DNA test, you think that you have a gene or two from this area mm -hmm. or you have an ancestor here. So one, I don't think it is not nonsense. It's, 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 I think it's the right way. You need to mm -hmm. meditate and connect yourself anyway, and then get that clarity to be able to work. And if you marry the subconscious, conscious psychological theories with now think fast, think slow on how you allow yourself to differentiate your reactions mm -hmm. between the rider and the elephant in this case, that I guess you would be able to get some good control on your own self in stressful situations. So not and acting on the impulse from the lizard brain and and simmer, kind of let it marinate and take take a decision based on your gut because we do have a, a my, uh, gut microbiome that's our second brain, right? And you got your connected, prefrontal connected, cortex. Yeah. I, would, I would say, yes, understand what your gut is telling you, connect it to your now real conscious, which is the rider in the case of Think Fast, and then mm. make a decision. And the point is in many, many times, you really don't need to decide now. Mm. Just breathe and then like decide. So um, it's it's your own it's your own um, treasure that you own no. is the time between the action and the reaction, right? So no. uh, I definitely didn't think we'd get into that, but I do appreciate the book recommendation. I will read it for sure because I'm books. in that space at the moment. Chapter two: Bringing 1.4 billion people online. Um, so, how did your life change after 9/11? What happened? Walk me through what happened after that day. The point after that, I would fast track to two years later, 2003, yeah. And I am in the office in Alcatel Lucent. At this time now, it is actually, I don't know how many times Alcatel changed it now. So Alcatel, Lucent, Nokia, and Nokia scene is Nokia now. It's Nokia. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Nokia now, and uh, my boss comes into the office and say, guys, we have a job in Iraq and we have a job in Nigeria. And we have three other jobs, Maldives, you mentioned it, and others mm -hmm. like rest, other nice fancy yeah. Tunisia as well nice uh, good portugal i think if i'm and then the list was having like six like immediate choices and like two which was nigeria and iraq mm -hmm. and then of course all my colleagues like da, 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 da. and then i raise my hand and i say okay uh what is happening in iraq and what is happening in nigeria and then he says okay then he tells me the scope of what is going to happen in iraq and he tells me the scope of what is going to happen in nigeria and i say okay uh, i'm going to go to nigeria and the rest of my colleagues said... You're crazy. Yeah, and of course, like it's not even like I was forced to choose. I chose yeah. Nigeria. And I chose Nigeria for very simple. It's uh, at this time, a new tech entrepreneur coming into the wallet from Nigeria. And mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, Mr. Adinoga, Mike Adinoga, is one of the tycoons of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Very complex history, by the way. But at this point of time, he wanted to build a tech tycoon, Globacom. We were supposed to go help him build that. Mm -hmm. So while the rest of my colleagues reached there to do a job, as per the title, we were all engineers. But as per the scope and the breadth, when you go into Nigeria in such a situation where no one doesn't want to go, mm -hmm. you actually get a bigger breadth of knowledge because you're doing everything. And I remember my first 
security briefing. I was visiting a region. I'm not going to mention it. I don't want to offend anyone. And then I was told on this route, we'll have two roads. Your security car will be in front of you mm -hmm. on both of roads, but I just want to inform you about your own risks. If you take this road, it has a lot of actually road blockers and gangsters. They normally start by shooting. Mm -hmm. And on this road, we have the same type of gangsters, but they normally start by putting fire on the place. So which one you prefer? And I was just, like smiling and said, just, I hope you guys know how to shoot back. So I will go with the shooting. Uh, I will uh, go with the fire. <laughs> and then I went there with the shooting, but it was my way back to the office. I called my boss. Uh, in your briefing, you didn't mention bulletproof vests or something, right? <laughs> And um, I ended up actually building in, in that time, I spent two years in Nigeria, ended up learning almost everything about building an operator, mm -hmm. connecting. We connected in two years, 50 million people to the communication at this time. We covered the whole Nigeria and uh, introduced BlackBerry. That time, BlackBerry was like 6G, mm -hmm. 3G, the first video calls. We did all of that. And it was all adding into different ways of managing stakeholders, managing risks, knowing things and sync with others. So back to your question about why, what did 9-11 change? It changed my perspective of risk. I wasn't the supposedly the safest one kilometer of the world no. by all the means till 8.15 a.m. And then mm -hmm. everything changed. It's not. So it kind of, I learned it that do whatever it takes to get to what you want. But sometimes it's just not meant. And if you kind of keep putting why not, why not, why not, you're not going to do anything. Just go. Did you see Nigeria or, um, you know, the other options that you had that were not um, sounding so luxurious? Did you see that as a better learning opportunity, development opportunity, that you wouldn't work on a small piece of the process, that you get to work on a larger scale and potentially have a bigger impact? Or what was, what was going through your mind? I saw Iraq and Nigeria are better uh, option to learn. That's for sure. And then at this time, what popped in my mind, Nigeria to Iraq, was Iraq at this time, it was 2004. It was really in the middle of the war. Mm -hmm. And all what we were asked to do there is just keep some service for the troops. While in Nigeria, almost a similar situation was a different level of rescue. There was a lot of kidnapping. There's a lot of actually reverse racism. We can talk about this later. But on the situation, poor and rich oil and gas issues. So there was... A lot of turbulence in Nigeria as well in 2003. Two assassinations, if I'm not remember, of yeah. presidents and vice presidents. Uh, uh, there was like something happening massively okay. there. But in Nigeria, it was building a full-fledged operator from scratch, not just providing a small level of service. And when I tell you about 2004, you think about Iraq war, you will never think about Nigeria. So it's not also yeah, on the spot. Right. Uh, so yeah. I can do mistakes. And that's what I did. And I did mistakes a lot. So there, but I learned as well. How did you go from there? What was the next project? What was the next challenge? And I'm also curious how you went from being a tech hands-on kind of guy to, to, to being more in the leadership positions as well. From 2003, I wrote a list. And one of these lists of my own promises to myself was that every two years, I must take a certification of something new and try to test myself there on how to do this. So from Nigeria, uh, along with actually Alcatel at this time, we had different perspective of different projects. I got the chance there to support with Togo, with Algeria, with Cameroon, Saudi Arabia, with Egypt, of course, and uh, Zain as well in Saudi Arabia, no mistake. And I'm not gonna mention all of them, but I had this time to chance to support with those while the main focus was global economy mm -hmm. in Nigeria. And uh, at that time, uh, this a lot had a vision to tap into, uh, it's called now e and to tap into the top 10 telco groups of the world. Mm -hmm. And they had a very interesting approach to that. They thought we're going to go and buy licenses in every big country, even if we're going to lose. And, and this didn't land in my head. What does it mean even if we're going to lose? And if you follow the track of the Salat at this time, they bought Nigeria license, Egypt mm -hmm. license, 
Afghanistan license, India license, Pakistan license. They went into all the, where's the big population? Let's go there and we know we're going to lose. Right. So I joined it a lot at this time to support in building the operator in Egypt, in my home country. But it was ringing my head, like, why did you want to lose? What the hell is Tibeta? Like, what is this? And, and why I built the company to lose? But I just want customers. So I started moving into that business by taking my first MBA and I went study. And this was the time, the two years clock. So I took <laughs> the MBA and then I took PMB and I started trying to understand, okay, ah, that's what they meant when they say they want to lose. They're just simplifying it to us here as an engineer. Don't worry about this. But they really don't want to lose. They just want to have healthy EBITDA. They don't care about the net profit because on the long term, they have a base. And with that uh-huh. longer base, they will farm it later, which now right. evolved in the industry. And I have many terms for it. We call it CVM or CPM or whatever names for that. So at this time, when I was trying to understand why the Salat is doing that, it's when it triggered my curiosity to zoom into okay, let me do my MBA instead of doing my master's of science or PhD. And Mm -hmm. I started taking that direction of actually mixing the business with that. Is that um, when you did the MBA, is that what you learned was the original intention that, you know, set up a kind of a base, set up a mode and make profit later? Or uh, was it maybe like a unrealistic task that even if you guys are failed, the maybe the outcome was still outweigh of, you know, potentially aiming too small. Yeah, what was the uh, intention that they had initially compared to what you understood from that? It's curiosity for sure. Just curiosity. I have something in my head. I'm talking to Alexander. This is our first time to meet or second or third. I should not assume that Alexander is stupid. So if what Alexander is saying doesn't make sense to me, so my initial approach would be Okay, I really like Alexander. He's nice. And it seems for me that he knows what he's talking about. And but it doesn't make sense to me. So let me first try to dig deeper and understand this. I apply this almost on everything. No. And this was one to first try to understand. Then I started liking it. So I would start first. It's very stupid for me to assume that the management of its lot are stupid. So let me try to understand what this does this language like- mean? It seems like you're very um, self-reflective and you're you're looking for shortcomings or flaws in your thinking rather than assuming somebody else is, like you said, stupid or intelligent or whatever that is. And that's very rare today. Like It seems like a lot of people, especially in positions of leadership or power, at least that we see publicly, right? It seems they lack self-awareness. It seems like there's no repercussions at the highest levels of positions of making mistakes, you know? Uh, it seems like sometimes incompetent people still stay in power or they still stay in control, maybe because of the people they build up around them. But yeah, it seems like you had the complete opposite approach to this. I would reverse the question, actually not reverse the question, reapply the same rule. I uh-huh. don't know whether they are incompetent or not in this situation or whether right. they are doing the self-awareness or not. I would first, my first assumption to at least, I give the person in front of me three chances. I really try to understand like I would not assume that they are not self-aware or they are not incompetent. I try uh-huh. to put the pattern and that's the most important part. If I would reflect on, there is a pattern and I need to see the pattern, how it is leading. And uh-huh. if I remove from the pattern, the non-logical assumptions that it's completely like the lowest possibility, the lowest probability that a person reaches to be a CEO of a big tycoon and he is not having IQ, EQ, and 10 advisors mm-hmm. telling him how to reflect on himself. And if that's happening, that's a big mistake. And nowadays, you put them lives at stake. But before I assume that this is happening, let me re- try to replay the pattern. And if I don't mm-hmm. understand the pattern and it's really important to me, then maybe let me try to understand more and study how those things are and then see how it works before assuming that I don't want to do this. But, and here's the big but. If it doesn't match my value system regardless, or I don't see the purpose in what they're doing regardless, there, I will not do it anyway. And I don't care to know what you think. Like how- You're not gonna start digging deeper into- I don't care. Into with their logic, yeah, I understand. In the case of it, it's a lot. They were connecting really developing nations. Why would you go to Nigeria on this mess? Or Mm. India, like really, they were doing good, actually. 
but losing. And this is the one that was not helped like linking with me. Why they're doing mm-hmm. good and is still losing. Mm-hmm. And do I really want to connect the people in Egypt to good internet? Yes, but they are losing. I don't care. At this time, I need to understand it first mm-hmm. because I don't think they are losing. I just don't understand it. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, I understand where you're coming but from. But if yeah. someone is actually taking a decision that we're going to test 10 nuclear weapon bombs on a people to I'm out. see that impact there, yeah, do it. Sorry. I don't care whether yeah, you're the yeah. smartest or the stupidest. It really? doesn't match my value. I don't want to go there. This is wrong. Do you get what I mean? I definitely do. Yeah. Yeah. And once you finish your projects in that year in Egypt, what was next for you? That's a career decision that at this point of time as well, everyone said it's crazy. Why are you doing that? And um, so three years in a row, that's a very interesting place where most of the companies get in. You built a business. So before I, and I answer this, I wanted to tell you about the curiosity when I ask it there and also the pattern coherence. It matters to, to understand the, the curiosity, the pattern of coherence and match everything to your value system. These three, the Iran was you mm-hmm. as a compass. And to just close these together, then I jump into trying to understand. Sure. Three years, company that is growing magnificent magnificently actually at this time and despite the fact that we didn't want to make profit we started making profit what happened after three years companies start to move from entrepreneurial startup lifestyle Mm -hmm. where Amir is having full autonomy on the whole western of Egypt like doing whatever you want and building sites here doing this here right and a campaign here doing Mm -hmm. whatever he wants here like building my team and all of that now we are corporate we're making profit now hmm Let's restructure. Mm-hmm. And um, on that restructure, I received a very funny call. Uh, Amir, um, your region is the best region in everything. This was not a compliment. It was by fact. At this time, the government of Egypt was launching quality assurance report every mm-hmm. quarter. And the region was really the best region across. But we're doing a restructure which will impact you and your scope will be halved. Pattern doesn't match. Mm-hmm. Like what, are what you was doing? missing? Well, Something yeah, didn't add up. I, I, it's not clicking with me. And then I said, like, why do you want to do that? You know it's gonna demotivate me, and you most likely know this means I'm leaving. He said, no, I'm not gonna let you leave. I said, okay, but I'm gonna leave. I'm not gonna do that. So it's not gonna work. He said, listen, I have five other regions. The rest of the regions are not performing as well, but the teams there are not bad teams. They are also good. <laughs> but they're not capable of handling the full breadth of the scope the way you're handling here. So I need the right thing for the business is to split the scope here into halves and add more manpower to start actually promoting the rest of the regions. I said, okay, so your appreciation to me is demoting me to not piss off someone else. Mm-hmm. And he said, if you frame it this way, it looks really bad, but I would like to do it this way. My answer to you is no. And my sincere request here is before you really finish the structure, you give me a heads up one month ahead so I can actually dignitly resign uh-huh. and find my own way. Um, yeah, the restructure happened. There was a lot of emotions there. I was not informed, but long story short, I said, thank you, I'm leaving. And I left. And then I had to stop and also look for a new job at this time. Then I found a very interesting project in Mozambique. So I had to fly end of the world and do something I like there. And it was very similar to the scope that they were offering me as the half, actually. But it wasn't my own terms. Not feeling that I'm being demoted or my right is being taken away from it because of that. Chapter 3. Achieving the Impossible telecom success how did you end up you know being pretty much directly responsible for bringing 1.4 billion people online where is that the accumulation of all of these countries together or uh were there any countries that the amount of people you connected were disproportionate compared to others like for example in iraq or afghanistan yeah where did the majority of those people come from it's 200, so uh, Nigeria was like 50 million. It's an accumulation of actually the operators mm-hmm. that we built to connect mm-hmm. from scratch. Actually. That's what I am accumulating. So it's Nigeria, Egypt, uh, Iraq, um, Tanzania, uh, mm-hmm. the big bulks are coming from the big 
a population country. So I like keeping track of simple numbers to make sure that it also gives me my metric, government. I guess. If I can give it to myself, like with trick and this, and then it's also reflected in the way I'm managing my teams afterwards. So if we are actually having a problem of services getting interrupted every frequently, I would run mm-hmm. a campaign. I will call it hundred thousand minutes of no outage. Okay, interesting. And then let the team run after the hundred thousand minutes of no outage. If you really break down the hundred thousand minutes of no outage divided by the thousand day, it's like almost ninety days which is not easy in the telco industry, by the way. But if a small group managed to do it, they get a big out, which normally it's going to be $1 per minute. And then it makes people run. But gamification and putting very small target there on things, it makes people have the micro win. Um, Instead of discharging your micro win and trying to break with the car on the next person to you in the traffic light, then get the micro win and adding five more minutes of low outages on in the service did that come from above or is that some some standard that you set for yourself that you had to set yourself some levels to keep it competitive or to kind of have a purpose yeah how did how did you come up with that now i'm gonna back to be the list that you wrote for yourself so one was two years uh upgrade your knowledge at least once every two years and then the second one is i want to touch half of the world population with one good thing even if it's a blood donation and that's a big challenge. That's a lot of people. Then telco, that's why telco is magic, right? You mm-hmm. immediately tap into 100 million if you fix the service for country like Egypt. Mm-hmm. Then you did something good for them. So, and it's very important to reflect on the purpose when we're doing things because it's, it's just big difference. When you're talking to a person, asking him to build a mobile site in the push of Nigeria and tell him, I will give you a compensation that is double the person that is building the mobile site in New York. Nice. Mm. It's completely different when you are actually really wiring your team. There's people in the rural areas of Nigeria that when they have an emergency, they cannot call 911. Actually, they cannot call their brother or sister to help. Yeah. People die because they're not able to connect. Let's do that together. The same letter happened with COVID in Iraq. It's just, we woke up in the morning, the whole world, not just Iraq. Everyone has to stay home. But some are privileged that when they're staying home, they have Netflix and Zoom calls and Facebook Mm. calls. And others, they don't even have electricity at home. Never wind that minimum mean to connect to their business or family or study. And what are we supposed to do there in Europe? Stay at home and let everyone else die their way out, getting out into the streets to find a means of life, or we try to do something about it. And mm-hmm. I remember the night when my team went into strike after the lockdown there, and this was the speech. Say, guys, I understand. If you want to go home, go home. No one of you will be touched. It's your family. It's your life. Go home. Mm-hmm. I will come together with my management team we would operate the network because one person going into the street and conducting COVID because we couldn't let him call to check where is his son, that's on my neck. I don't mm-hmm. want that bad conscious. But wow, on the same that's time, heavy. I want us to be safe and deliver the things as well. I don't, I'm not going to also take that bad conscious in any one of you. And it's painful that if one of your team die because of your decision. Mm-hmm. So it's double bad. So I rather say it there and do it there. So the the reason why I'm telling you this, the purpose is very important. And asking a person to go into a very bad place to build something or dig a street to connect something, you must connect to their value system and they must believe that that's what you want to do as well. Mm -hmm. It's not like something else. And you're not a guy sitting in an office in Germany in a $3,000 suit telling people over video call, to go back out there and set up the infrastructure. You're there on the ground with them. This was my biggest complaint of my boss in Iraq. He never find me in my office. Mm. Where are you? I'm in Mosul, sir. Like, Mosul? How did you even go there? I said, don't worry, we'll fix it later. And then, <laughs> and so on. So it's exactly it. If I want to tell my team to climb a tower, then mm. I should be there. Yeah, yeah. If I'm asking you to sacrifice your life, what is it? Is your life more valuable than my life? 
Really. So it's not. Chapter four, AI and engineering, building a future for the benefit of all. You probably have so many more stories that we can probably spend days talking about. I'd like to change gears. And I know you're big into kind of future tech and deep tech. Uh, last time that we connected, we spoke about AI. So I'm curious to kind of hear your thoughts. I know you have some opinions that you don't need to get into, but about Sam Altman or guys like Mark Zuckerberg or maybe guys like Elon Musk. Uh, but yeah, where do you see the AI industry at the moment? Where do you see it going? And um, yeah, maybe about the ethics involved in, in AI technology as well. I'm an engineer. I value, we don't have in many countries our own vow that we give when like doctors, for example. But in Egypt, we have. Mm -hmm. So we, we promise to do good. And um, engineering is about doing things that serve humanity at that. People can do uh, um, nice products that can get hierarchically different. Some of them are like, for me, like, since you mentioned Mark, what did Facebook add to the humanity? I don't know. It's digital to digital and all of this. We can talk about freedom of speech. We can talk about other things, but there was other means of doing it. Comparing that to the mission with Elon Musk to go to the moon or Mars or have non-terrestrial living and working on its value system, you can feel that Elon in this scenario is really trying to fix a problem. You might think of it as imminent or not, or I might think about it as imminent or not, but there's definitely thinking of good. No. That intention differs. Taking someone's life because he signed the DNR in the US, it's keeping their right. But taking someone's life in the street because you want to take their wallet is also taking their life. The intention matters. Now back to the AI. It's not new to have AI. It's not new at all, actually. Like your calculator is AI. No. Yes. It's uh, uh, um, what changed lately is having much bigger sources of information and data. The data sources are big now and stored. And we have the enough muscle and cloud and uh, computing power to tab into this data and try to make sense out of it. Now, adding models like Gen AI, which by the way, one of my best friends had already a Gen AI model done 10 years ago, right. and he was working with it on telco data. So um, it's not like the Gen AI model itself it's fine. It's not really the big deal there. Having an AI, it started from the calculator till now. We are trying to always uh, delegate jobs to someone else to do it for us. From the calculator till actually now delegating, writing an email on my behalf. Mm -hmm. It happens. So long story short, I think Gen AI is a tool like Excel and PowerPoint and Access or whatever tools we learn in our day to day. We all have to master it. It's there, it will exist. Will that Gen AI or actually more evolved with AI and automation use cases takes people jobs? I actually, it will take the jobs that were supposed to be taken away anyway. Mm. It's not something, I think if you repurpose it right, a person that is having lower IQ than a person and knows how to prompt an AI engine is even having a better shot to stay on his job than he yeah. was two years ago, or her job two years ago. So that's the second point. Now, the third point about ethics. As an engineer, and I hope it clicks with many people that are going to be hearing us here, we do mistakes. That's for sure. You're not going to always have the good call. It can happen that you don't have a good call. But it matters that you are knowing that you want to do the good call. And if you are programming a Gen AI model that after you finish it, no one really can track it back. It's very is it's very hard to diagnose than to build. Mm -hmm. And in your own way of coding, you find yourself on a choice that you need to choose. My autonomous car, if it's gonna crash into a person, I will differentiate them based on race. Think twice. If that's really the only way that you can actually put that differentiator there. Or if my sponsor will be very upset if I mention humanitarian situation in Gaza mm -hmm. in a Gen AI answer, it will be 
right or wrong. Conflict of interest, of course. Yeah, just yeah. do it as it is. And this is the beauty of being an engineer. This machine needs to work this way and it will work this way. Not many people understand what we do. So mm -hmm. we can write a lot of ethical codes around those things which it has to be done. AI Act, European Ethical Code has to be there. Things has to be there because people also need to know that actions has consequences, but better actually improve and remember that definitely engineers are here to do good and do good. Mm -hmm. Don't choose their own decision. I have a lot of friends who are engineers and I would say all of them, they seem to have their ethics in the right place. They seem to be proponents of open source. They seem to be proponents of documenting things. Uh, even some ambiguous functions or some weird parameter that nobody knows about and making it public because once upon a time they did come across a random blog post that helped them solve a particular bug and they want to give back. They seem to be very open about uh, decentralization and, and stuff like that. How do you see that playing in with, with AI? Because um, a lot of companies are having their own models. Do you see it that the performance or the abilities are going to be pretty similar and we as users are, like, are going to get to choose which model we're using if we want to use you know a phone that was ethically produced without uh, child labor you know somewhere extracting minerals from the ground or we buy an iphone right or we buy a black do you see the same thing with the models that we're going to use uh, for ai in the future we need to have another half an hour to talk about the child labor point of view but i'll put that aside uh yes you will because at the end of the day, the real differentiator is in the hardware and the cloud. Mm -hmm. And models, it's going to flood you. You will have abundance of, of models to choose. In my humble view, AI, IoT, automation, all of those and more, that will be robotics, whatever comes into our inhuman chips, uh, humanoids, all of this. At the end of the day, it's about the use case. For some time, you might really feel that you want to monetize, what, two years, three years, four years, five years, monetize the AI itself as an AI, but mm -hmm. afterwards it's going to be really about monetizing the use case. I don't see anyone saying in CV now, I have a big value, I know how to use Excel. It's yeah, given. definitely. Mm. You cannot really cash in it anymore. So the use cases will be the in the driving seats. I think they are already in the driving seats. So just use cases, and then you can you will be able to choose whatever tech you need. It's available. No one is blocking it. We can come and tomorrow together, and we will sit for two weeks, and we will build our own GNI model. But the problem is where to tap into the data and where to have the right hardware to support it. Right. And back to the topic of kind of uh, ethics and regulation, do you see that that's something that has to come from the engineers themselves from the very beginning and build into like the 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 software, the architecture, the products that they're building from the start. Because again, it seems like oftentimes politicians, they try to, again, you can argue uh, either regulate too prematurely or maybe not regulate enough until something goes wrong and, and things go wrong. But again, I, I get that people who are actually building these products, they have a much deeper understanding of how to build it. And a lot of times when you see politicians discussing this and bringing people in front of the Congress and the grilling them about you know, the, the work that they did, it seems they have no idea what's happening. Like, the, you know, it's an 80-year-old questioning a 30-year-old tech guy that's been working on this thing for 15 years. So how do you see that um, as the right way to do it? Or how did you implement ethics within your work over the past couple of decades? Uh, well, first, before I talk about the ethics, I'm just going to take you to 20 years ago. I was supporting in an oil and gas factory. And there was something happening, and then I ended up like lashing on one of the technicians. Of course, I'm an engineer. He's a technician. Right. What is this? And then um, my dad happened to be the VP of this company at this time when I was there. So he fined me, like, had a salary cut. And then when I went home, I was so angry. How could my dad do this to me? What is this? Why are you doing this to me? And so like, I said, you need to learn this. You can never work without your team. And in our work, building and building and building, complexity gets more complex. And one little wire in one little box, thousand miles away of you, get detached. And the only person who knows how to deal with this thousand miles away box is the technician next to it. You will disassemble the whole process and disassemble the whole platform 
to just find that small wire. Mm -hmm. The other alternative is you treat this team well, the team likes you, the team knows what is behind. You pick the phone call and say, guys, looks like we have a problem in this area. Can everyone check? And he will see the wire immediately. So now reverse and replicate back to your question about AI. Sit in your desk in the Congress or wherever you are sitting and trying to ask the people to do what they do. They will tell you, we did it. And how are you going to prove them wrong? You wait for things to go wrong. <laughs> and then it already happened. Or you spend a lot of money to get another engineer to audit that engineer to find that this engineer have done the work. No. And by the way, there's no way on earth that an engineer will not find another mistake to another engineer. It's simple. Like <laughs> there's always something that doesn't tie up here. Yeah. And then you end up coming with another report and you see the cyclone here. All things starts growing, right? So I rather actually focus on growing up our young engineers, our young entrepreneurs, our young kiddos in understanding the values of humanity right without actually adding any of the complications on this. Understand that the consequence of what you're doing is always bigger than what you see now. I like that it all ties into your your kind of greater philosophy. And it, I'm happy that you discovered kind of what is, uh, you stumbled into your calling seems like in life. I feel like you're one of the few people that based on what you did, it seems like the world needed you to do this kind of stuff. And there's probably not a lot of people willing to do what you did. And maybe for you, it feels like it's nothing that you just kind of stumbled in it or you were curious or it was interesting. But yeah, I just, I'm trying to wrap my head around kind of the, the impact that you're having. And I really appreciate as well that you talk a lot about leadership. You talk about treating people well. You talk about bringing billions of people. You know, you're still uh, on your way to bringing half of the world, but I think you, you made a big dent. And having that education, having those kind of critical services and people's basic needs of safety and, you know, just taken care of, that once that's out of the way and we are interconnected and we can actually focus on educating people, building things with ethics, treating everybody right and embedding this not only in what we say, but actually the work that we do on a daily basis. So I think that ties into it really well. Yeah. Ask why always. It's easier. Mm -hmm. Why am I doing that? It's going to be easier. In, yeah. in, and even it will make the work easier, actually, much easier. Like mm -hmm. it wouldn't feel hard. Chapter five. Where will the second chapter of your life begin? Amir, I'm conscious of your time as well. And thank you so much for, uh, for, for sharing all these stories. I thought we were going to get into more technical stuff, but I think this is way better. Uh, I'm curious to know, because I know you're into kind of um, deep tech and future tech. Could you tell me a little bit about uh, your new companies, what you're planning to do with the second half of your life um, in terms of humanitarian work or charity work or continuing bringing you know, the poor people up to the same standard as the rest of us. Um, and yeah, what technology is keeping you interested and what do you have planned for, for the future? So um, um, I actually really believe that the only accelerator to anything that can accelerate a problem is technology. Like that's sincere belief as well in me. Like if you continue adding a carrot, you will get cut carrot at the end. But the only way that you make it faster is a different technology. And yeah reason of how to make it faster. So I feel I need to start building myself. I made a conscious uh, decision early this year that I would like to change career and go more into helping to direct where the money goes no. on the bigger level and then building from that angle. Uh, so I'm switching career to try to tap more into private equity venture capital and see how can I help there to get it from the source push the money really? to where I think it can be pushed can and also prove impact. that that can make money. This type of roles and finding that project that would really touch me, I know it will take time. And on the same time, I had a lot of legacy in my head that I wanted to make sure it goes into place. So I embarked with a journey with a couple of my colleagues and we started two ventures actually. One is Qualitech mm -hmm. and uh, Qualitech is going to be focusing on emerging and challenging markets telco industry supporting in this place uh, how to expand. We have three programs there. It's how we expand uh, reach, how to actually develop from telcos to techcos. And the third one is how to create more resources towards the right actually implementations that you need to do in your business. 
and those three families are actually going to be taken care of totally by my colleagues and partners in Qualitech. I will be definitely setting the business with them for the coming six to nine months and making sure that things are in place. And mm -hmm. hopefully one of the projects also triggers me, then I'll maybe start mingling around there with that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that's on the telco because I don't think I have enough emotional attachment to telcos not to drop it. Let's put it this way. Right, right. And uh, Qualitech will be my bridge there. The second venture is Innovatics. And in Innovatics, we actually made it our mission to help entrepreneurs get into proper validation for their business models, their business ideas, and get matched it hopefully later to the right investment and also help the investors to not just pour money into non-validated ideas. Like it's so scary that 85% of the new tech ventures fail. Mm -hmm. It means a lot of wasted resources and these resources can be redirected to emerging markets and doing something there instead of really losing it all in trying to idea that can be validated. So if our a small venture in Innovatics managed to take this percentage from 85% to 70%, then we have contributed 15 down 15% 15 of the investments into entrepreneurship. Six, uh, succeeding technology. Yeah, uh, there to, to get a trust. So we have their three categories. Build category, where we actually, it's idea to MVB, and then we help the entrepreneur there, consult them, actually. And again, it's the fee, and I insist on that, that you need to be also one of the first lessons is that if you want to be an entrepreneur, have your meet in the game, point blank. Mm -hmm. And that's on the build from idea to MVB. And then we are actually taking the grow, where if you have an MVB, but again, most of the entrepreneurs get hung up on the tech. I call myself a tech leader, but I tell you the tech is the last thing you should worry about. So this is you should focus first on customer journey, operating model, and what's your business model. If this mm -hmm. radio is linked, then we'll find the right tech to make it work. That's and where the right engineers of all of our amazing to get you done with this. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is the, what we call the Elevate package. If you are an existing business, but you're feeling that your value moved away out of your business or struggling to open new market, or you want to create more vertical or horizontal integrations in your value chain, we can also be able to help there. And also, we have in this whole boutique open to investors to come and see the validated ideas and choose them. And maybe by five, 10 years from now, we become the validators of the tech investments in the world. Mm -hmm. I trust my team can go there. I'm helping again, as I said, for the coming six to nine months till I find the, the big. The, the big, the next big challenge. Yeah. That's, that's Although it's very exciting to see all of this experience you bring on board. And now you're going to actually helping business people succeed, driving funding towards these businesses. And I, I hope as well, and I look forward to see how your ethics and your leadership and leadership in the real sense of that word comes across through companies that you advise and invest in and the technologies that they bring. So, Amir, I think that's a good place to end there. We will link everything that you discussed in the show notes to your companies and uh, for people who want to reach out to you, what is the best way to connect? Is it on LinkedIn? Is it via email? Or LinkedIn is easiest. I can also put my email in the footnotes. I'm available on almost all the social media with the same name. Came early on all of them, actually. So mm -hmm. uh, you got it. You got it. So yeah, just yeah. find Amir of the Lazim, you'll find me. Perfect. Well, Amir, thank you so much for your time. I'd love to do this again, maybe uh, six to 12 months from now and see how far you've came along with your projects and uh, hear some more of your stories. Lovely, Alexandra. It was really lovely to chat with you. Honestly, you sparked my uh, brain and thinking and imaginations and took me to m places in my memories, memories that I would have loved to remember. Thank you for that. Well, I appreciate it. It was very genuine. And thank you so much. Wishing you best of luck and look forward to catch up again in the future. Same here. Have a lovely day. You too. Unwrapped Tech Leadership Journeys, Baldur Connect Podcast.